it's swirling but it is blowing in their direction generally so it's definitely smell that got this buffalo uneasy and now it looks like it's seen him now the buffalo has seen him and what is going to happen next now his huffing and puffing and his behavior is going to rile up the other cape buffalo which are getting up now and they may all start chasing these lions can you believe that this is happening live this very second in africa and it's a great pleasure to have so many people on board what is undoubtedly the biggest safari vehicle in the world there go the lions and at least they got to quench their thirst but you may find that these big old bulls will continue to pursue them and chase them away from their place of relaxation no good having two villains two lions at your health spa where you enjoy typically relaxing and isn't this a wonderful turn of events how not always is it the lion chasing the buffalo but sometimes it's the other way around now that wasn't the case this morning and these two lioness along with three other members of their pride also three lioness managed to successfully bring down a cape buffalo and it was a young buffalo and it was sadly after drives and against both jamie's thoughts and my thoughts as to what the lions would actually do this morning they got up in a very hot portion of the day just after we had closed down our safari and chased these buffalo and didn't manage to bring one down now what i can do is while we're here i can actually tell you a bit about the story before possibly handing over to jamie you'll be able to tell you a little bit more she's out on another vehicle the lions are lying up to the left of this open dry water hole and basically kind of somewhere on the other side of these bushes over here and the buffalo were across in this direction kind of lying up up ahead they were waiting in queue uh, to come and have a drink at this water hole because there was a herd of elephants occupying it initially and it's a very dry time it's a drought and animals are really fighting over the water so the buffalo were waiting patiently for the water until eventually the elephants left and then we stopped our morning safari and eventually the buffalo made their way to this water hole and then from here they went back down towards where the lions were sleeping and obviously the opportunity was just too good to resist and the lions began to take chase after the buffalo now this is going to be a good time for you guys to jump on board with jamie and tebs and you're going to hear the story from her because she was here to see it all firsthand and good afternoon to you ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the sunset safari where we are sitting just a couple of hundred meters away from scott and the rest with the rest of the Inkahuma pride uh, in these live safaris we can never script anything we can never plan anything we just have to let the animals tell their stories and what an extraordinary story they had in store for us this morning so after the sunrise safari where i know scott has already explained the setup that was happening at voyatella dam i decided to take the two lovely ladies nikki and kirsty our two directors who sit in final control and get to watch all of this happening through the screen but I thought I'd take them down there to go and have a look at what I thought was going to be five lions lying in the shade. And nine times out of ten, that would have been exactly what it was. But as it happens, we came down to Boyatella Dam just as one of the buffalo, I think, had walked straight towards the lions. They'd moved back towards the dam, and the lions had exploded out into a chase. And as we drove down that clearing in the Mahindra, there were just buffalo stampeding straight up towards us. We were just right place right time although it was nearly the wrong place at the wrong time because we had to do some very fast maneuvering around a very panicked herd of buffalo dust flying everywhere sudden realization that scott was on quarantine having a morning jog we watched the lions as they chased and i thought they were going to give up they missed the initial sort of initial charge completely and most of the lionesses stopped in the middle of the dam panting it was hot it was over 30 degrees centigrade and they just carried on the one female just kept going kept targeting and she raced all the way around inga's house and around here the buffalo herd panicking racing through here and eventually 
we suddenly realized that they were coming straight towards quarantine. So we changed direction. We went looking for Scott, trying to find him, looking for his bright blue running shorts. Eventually we located him. He hopped on the back with us. I think somewhat relieved to be away from that situation because it became very unpredictable. Buffalo panicking in every direction. Now we've always said that lions are ambush predators and most of the times, most of the time they will give up the hunt, but these guys were hungry, they were desperate and they just raced across and they caught a buffalo where we are here. Now I know that Scott's lions have just got up, so let's pop over to him. Well, isn't this fantastic? And we just meters away from this thirsty lioness. It looks like she's thinking about returning to try and take another drink. And you can see her muddy chin there, which shows you that she probably didn't have much joy trying to quench her thirst initially. So she's over here. The other one is lying down further away from us, but not too far away. And it is a great pleasure to say hello to Mr. Will Fox and Carol, who are over in Manchester, England at the Times Destination Show. And whoever else is watching us there, it's a huge privilege to welcome you as well onto this live safari and we're looking forward to answering some of your questions and hearing your thoughts and comments like i said what a great start we've got to it's still very hot this afternoon and usually lions will be very sleepy in hot weather but because of their thirst i guess they are willing to try and overcome this heat and it's making for some wonderful viewing as you've seen already it's not often that we start the show early but today we had good reason to and didn't want you guys to miss out on anything. And who knows, possibly we're going to have to extend the show later on this evening. Who knows what that buffalo carcass not too far away from here will attract. There may be some interaction between these lioness and some hyena who live at a den site not too far from here. And as Andrew pans back, you get a good idea of how habituated the animals are in this area. And that they have got no concern with our presence and that's exactly how we like to keep it in a situation where we fit in merely as spectators this is going to be a great shot look at this this is what the lioness is up against hello to joseph on youtube and my first question for the day. Joseph would like to know how quickly can a lion run? And it's a good question, Joseph, and an interesting one because it can be applied to some interesting behavior showed by these lions this morning. Now, on average, over a very short distance, lions will be able to use those incredibly powerful muscles to charge in at around 25 meters a second. Leopards ever so slightly faster than that, but I mean, that's frighteningly quick. That would, to put it in human perspective, run the 100 meter sprints in four seconds. But usually it's a short lived burst. Oh, wasn't that affection wonderful? And who knows what these lionesses are, are thinking now? They've been shown up once, they're thirsty, but they look like they could be heading back in the direction of where that kill is which is probably only half a mile away from here. Sorry, Joseph. So usually it'll be about 25 meters a second, but a short burst. They usually don't chase their prey for very far. But this morning what is what's interesting is that they chased them from here, probably about half a mile to three quarters of a mile to where they finally managed to bring down one young calf. And according to Jamie, who was close to these lions this morning, we were in the same sighting, but not nearby. And Jamie said they were looking very, very hungry. And that is a good example of how their behavior will alter depending on how hungry they are. When they're full bellied, they can be a, a little bit more lazy, but always opportunistic. So if ever there is an opportunity to make a kill, lions and leopards, as well as cheetah and wild dog, will always take it. Hello to Charlie, who's sent through our first question from all of the folks in Manchester. And Charlie would like to know, when is the best time of year to come on safari? And Charlie, in the Sabi Sands in South Africa, where we are now, uh, it remains fairly constant throughout the year. Your ability to see great game viewing 
and high profile game including leopard, rhino, elephants and these two animals making up the big five is throughout the year and your luck will vary just depending on your few days here. However, personally my favorite time of year is the winter. I prefer the cooler temperatures and the, be the ability to be able to spend all day out on safari whereas in the summer months it can be excruciatingly hot and also lots of bugs are out. So those are a couple of reasons why I prefer the winter over the summer. Cooler weather, less insects and flies bothering you. But it all depends on your kind of personal plans and hopes for the safari. If you're an ornithologist, you definitely want to come in the summer months because there's twice as many birds here. All the migrants come from far and wide for the bounty of insects. And you can hear how the wind is really picking up strongly. I don't think we have to worry about a storm blowing in. The clouds up in the sky are not looking bad at all. Look at this, this buffalo. And that one's got an awesome spread. Just took a few steps forward and again, the lions are forced to retreat. You may see a little bit more affection from them as they rejoin. No. And isn't this wonderful? I mean, that's within about a meter and a half of the vehicle. Too good. That funny little camera on the front of the vehicle there is actually seven cameras all bundled up together. And we are making sure that we are at the forefront of 360 degree filming. And it would have been a wonderful opportunity for me to have the camera on then. It is now off, but I'm too focused on chatting with you guys. Um, but that's what that is, if some of you were wondering. And isn't it remarkable that the technology out these days is really allowing us to immerse ourselves? Oh, Andrew spotted the buffalo really coming after the lions now. Hello to Kimby, who's also watching on YouTube, and you've mentioned how you would have loved to see the actual hunt and the takedown. And don't worry, um, so would all of us, and I was busy running around the quarantine clearings, as uh, Jamie's mentioned. The, the, the girls were the closest, the two directors and Jamie, they were closest to the action, but we didn't see the actual takedown. And to be honest, we don't very often see kills for a number of reasons, um, mainly because the predators aren't as successful as we would like them to be. Obviously, they're successful enough to be able to feed themselves, but a lot of attempted hunts don't result in a takedown. So it's something that we don't see that often, and especially especially this morning after Jamie and I predicted the complete opposite of what happened. We all feel a little bit guilty for you guys not seeing the action, but the girls did have their cell phones out with them and they did take some wonderful, wonderful video clips that we've edited together. And as soon as this commotion dies down, we will be sure to play you the clip of the action that was seen. So that's something to look forward to. Gail, also in Manchester, and great to have you with us. I hope you're enjoying being on safari. And Gail's interested to know what is one of the best or most memorable things that I've seen since being here on Safari Live. And it's a tricky one to answer, Gail, because I guess there's different genres of sightings. You get kind of high action sightings or high emotion sightings. I'm going to go with high emotion and it was when we thought that we were only going to be doing this for a three month stint that was going to end in January 2015 and it was my last drive at the end of January and it's a wonderful time of year to be out here because the marula fruits are in season and the elephants will literally run from tree to tree in search of these marula fruits and I was enjoying my final drive or what I thought was my final drive for Safari Alive with so many elephants all around us running around the vehicles eating the fruits and there was especially one young calf that came right up to the bull bar of the vehicle almost to say goodbye to me i don't think it had a clue that i was leaving well of course it didn't but that's one sighting that uh, will always stand out high in my memory bank as an emotionally 
gratifying sighting. But we have got some incredibly high-paced action sightings as well, whilst following leopards, lions, and wild dogs hunting. We don't see cheetah too often here, so that's one predator that's missing off the list. But of course, the high-intensity, high-action sightings, and sightings of animals that are rare, like snakes. Jamie the other day had an incredible sighting of a black mamba, where I'm sure her as well as her cameraman's heart rates were absolutely through the roof. So we get surprised very often, and we are very, very fortunate with the viewings that we do have here, Gail. And I guess the only way to confirm that is for you to keep joining in on these safaris. You can see these buffalo aren't giving up on the lion and pushing them further and further away. Hello to Chris and Rhea, who are watching in Liverpool and are a little bit concerned about our safety here. And it is quite a bizarre thing that on this open vehicle next to such a potentially dangerous animal, we are safe. And there's Andrew giving an idea of how far away we are from them. I'd say it's about six or seven meters. And as you saw earlier, they're happy to pa pass within meters of us. Well, thankfully, because this reserve and many others throughout Africa have been running as photographic safari destinations for many, many years, these animals have become habituated and accustomed to us. And because we never feed them and because we never harm them, which are two major things out here in nature, if you can secure your next meal and not be harmed by anything, life is good. And by us staying out of those two very important facets of these wild animals' lives, we always become neutral to them because we're never harming them, we're never providing them food. We become this kind of neutral object that doesn't make a difference in their lives. And that's why a healthy lion like this is not going to cause any problem with us. And the only time you will tend to find problems with animals is if they become diseased, rabid for example or very, very old, then you may need to start being a little bit more cautious around them. But it is remarkable how gentle, gentle persuasion over many, many years has afforded us to be able to spectate these animals without having any impact on their day. Oh, well spotted, Gilly, in Wisconsin. And that is the other joy about these live safaris. People from all over the world are together sharing these memories and experiences. And Jilly's noticed that the lioness in picture has got a broken right canine on her bottom jaw. And well spotted there, I love it when you guys keep us updated on these little things you're noticing. And I'm not too sure when that canine was broken. It doesn't look like a recent break. I'm looking through my binoculars. But wouldn't it be interesting to know what exactly would have caused that? Possibly taking down some buffalo or fighting with other lions. Who knows? The buffalo seem to have calmed down now. They have stopped pushing the lions away and lions seem comfortable in their new waiting spot, queuing for the local, local watering hole. And we're gonna stay right here and send you across to Jamie to see how those other three lioness are doing. And as we sit about a quarter of a mile away from where Scott is with the rest of the pride, Chris and Rhea, you were wondering where the rest of the pride is. Well, here we are, three Nkuhuma lionesses with very round bellies, lying contentedly in the shade of a pultiforum tree. And drought times like this, the lives of the lions become so much easier as their prey is forced around the water holes. And Sarah, you were wondering what kind of effect the drought has on the herds. It means that they have to move around limited water sources and they have to travel further and further in order to find access to food, especially for buffalo, which are more grazers than they are browsers, so they eat mainly grass. 
there's very little for them to eat out here and they've been wandering through and covering large distances. We've also noticed with the buffalo herds that they've fractured, they've split. We were seeing herds of up to 400, 500 animals, now sitting at around 100 per herd. And it is a time of plenty for these Nkuhuma lionesses. It means that they don't have to travel as far because the prey has to come to them. But as you saw with those buffalo, the buffalo do not go down or do just not submit without a fight. And this morning we were treated to the most extraordinary scene in which a female, and we don't know, we have no idea if, what was, if it was spurned out of maternal instinct or if it was a show of sheer courage and loyalty to another herd member, but the female, and for those of you who were watching this morning, the female with the very droopy horns, she came back to try and save the sub-adult. I think the calf that they killed was about maybe 11, 12 months old, and an old, old cow. She was very, you could see she was very old. She was starting to go bald, and she came back, and she desperately responded to the distress calls of the buffalo and tried again and again to chase these lionesses away. Just going to show that buffalo are not to be tangled with lightly. But it is a time in which we are going to see the comeback of the Nkuhuma pride, a pride with, that we've been following the stories of for the last few months. When I first started working here in July, there were eight animals, and apparently a couple of months before that last year, there were nine of them. And in the course of a pride takeover, a natural process in which other younger males come in and remove the territorial pride males, kick them, either kick them out or kill them, in that process, the Nkuhuma pride came into enormous conflict with them and was essentially decimated. At least two adult females and at least one sub-adult female were killed by the Birmingham boys, as they are known. A coalition of five young males, which is why it's so wonderful to see these lions return once again to the heart of Juma with full bellies and all looking in excellent health. And who knows? might even start to see the beginnings or the stirrings of pregnancy for the new era of the Birmingham boys and their first offsprings, offspring coming through. And with five young, powerful fathers to protect them, the Nkuhuma pride can start to boost its numbers once again with fresh genetics. You can see how fast they are breathing, all part of the heat produced in that digestive process. first started working here there was a young male that was that went by the name of Junior he was part of the Nkuhuma pride Joyce you were wondering where Junior is Junior was roughly at the cusp he was about three and a half four years old when the Birmingham boy takeover happened and we were already starting to remark that it was quite unusual for him to still be with the pride we suggested maybe because he didn't have any siblings or any cousins that he could move out on his own he was a bit more reluctant to start to leave the pride and establish himself as a male within his own territory. Joyce, I honestly have no idea where Junior is. He's wandered off somewhere, which is what essentially was going to happen. And it sort of links into the question from Dejo, because a couple of mornings ago, there was a Birmingham boy. One of the Birmingham boys was with three of the Nkuhuma lionesses on Buffles Hook Dam. And you were wondering where he's gone. He's moved off somewhere towards, towards Nkoro, the sort of southern section, to rejoin the rest of his brothers and his cousins. And I think the presence of those Birmingham boys have really started, now that they are associating more with the Nkuhuma pride and mating with some of the females, they've actually essentially forced Junior out onto his own. Now that he's big enough to really pose a threat to them, it was time that he made himself scarce. He's not related to them. And although it's not unheard of for unrelated members to join in or to join other coalitions, it is highly unlikely that it would be the case with Junior. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you around because although these lionesses still have full bellies, there's a little bit of the buffalo still left. And I think in the heat of the day, they've decided that they actually can't eat anymore right now. So what will happen with predators, all of the predators out here, without exception, they will gorge themselves 
until they reach the point where they actually cannot eat anymore. And it's a way of reacting to the fact that you just never know when you might lose your kill. So this, there's still plenty of meat left here though. Try not to drive through stomach contents. Now the interesting part of the story, it's not over yet. There you go, there's the young sub-adult. Horn is just starting to come through, which is what tells me it's about 11 to 12 months of age. And now there's plenty of meat still on this carcass. And as I said, the story is not over yet because they have moved and made this kill right in the heart of a hyena clan territory. And our regular viewers will be very familiar with the hyena clan of Juma a powerful clan that's also been doing exceptionally well in this drought and what i just want to show you is what they've done and what the lions have done to help to cover the scent and to help to keep this kill a secret from the hyenas for as long as possible on the ground here are the stomach contents so the smelliest part of the carcass and they've actually expelled that from the buffalo and you can see how they've swept and covered grass across the top of it and in fact you can even see Yes, there you go, covering it up. And if we move a little bit further down to the dirt just in front of it, you can see where the lion's claw marks are etched in the dirt from that process. So a way of hiding the scent as much as possible, trying to keep it secret. Because five females of their size, although they might be able to hold off hyenas, they would far rather have the protection of the males Males with a good 100 kilograms or 150 kilograms over the females are a really, really useful hyena deterrent. It's one of the reasons why the prides are perfectly accepting of the fact, first that and the fact that they can't really fight back, but they're accepting of the fact that the prides will, or the males will come in and consume as much of their kill as possible. So plenty of meat still. They've eaten the best parts first, as they always do. The organs, the heart, the liver, and the lungs. Now, a lion's kill is a free for all in terms of feeding. And unlike most other animals, apart from the fact that the male will get the lions shared, so to speak, they will all have to fight for access to the kill. And Diana, who's from the northwest of England, a warm welcome, or in this particular temperature, a very warm welcome to our sunset safari. You were wondering, because the two with Scott don't look maybe as full as the other two do, and you were wondering if maybe it's the case that they were some subordinate to these lionesses and didn't get as much chance to eat. I don't think so, and that's purely by the fact that if they were still feeling really hungry, they might have decided to come and feed still. There's still plenty of, the, of meat left for them to eat. Here's what I think that happened, is that chase, that hunt, was incredibly long. For a lion, that is usually an ambush, short sprint, and attack predator, that was a very, very prolonged hunt. And it covered nearly a kilometer in distance, so half a mile. Usually those hunts are over in about a couple of hundred meters. And it's hot, it's really hot today. And I think those lions were just desperate for water. They might have been more thirsty than they are actually hungry. And what we wanna do is, because we did film the part of the morning saga for you, and I will, put out a warning for those of you who are sensitive to graphic scenes the, the the kill is actually very graphic and it may be hard for sensitive viewers to watch so we're going to we're going to play it for you now but i would suggest for sensitive viewers maybe just look away for two minutes enjoy the clip guys Jamie Scott's running around quarantine. <laughs> it's 
that going to be an issue? No, idea. How cool is that? That so is so cool. cool. Oh, oh shit, it's still alive. It's still alive. Yeah. Ooh. So guys, Easy. how are you feeling? Yes. How cool is that? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, this isn't live, guys. <laughs> We're sorry it isn't live, everyone. But they've just taken down this buffalo. <laughs> Oh, shame. Here's a buffalo at the back coming through. Big cow. I'm just getting up too. Why is this not lying? Graphic and in certain circumstances very difficult to watch, but of course all part of nature and part of life and death. And before Will and Carol and the rest of the folks watching over in Manchester at the Times Travel Destination show, before you leave, just in terms of uh, other difficult things to chat about, John, you wanted to know what we do to protect the rhinos in this particular area. Now, John, we at Wild Earth don't show rhino, just on the very unlikely chance that there might be somebody with, involved in the poaching schemes or involved in the trade of illegal rhino horn might be watching. So very sadly, because they do occur in this area, very sadly we actually can't stop and talk about them, but we do chat about them in general for our audiences. As to what this huge protected area does in terms of anti-poaching, huge amounts of money are invested. There are people up in choppers, there are teams with dogs, the military is involved along the eastern boundary of Kruger towards the Mozambique border so there's plenty that happens I cannot really give you any more detail than that and that's largely because I actually don't know exactly the full anti-poaching policy and that's deliberate they those involved within it do so very top secretly it gives them a way of having a network of informants as well as being able to just protect those rhinos properly without the risk of any internal information leaking out so they do plenty of stuff to protect them and millions and millions of rand goes into protecting rhino both in this area and across the country and it seems with our fingers crossed it seems as though for the first time last year rhino poaching numbers are starting to drop so wonderful news and to all of you at the times destination show i hope you really enjoyed a brief snippet of our sunset safari I know that you will have to leave soon. For the rest of our regular viewers, we've got another few hours and who knows whether or not the hyenas are going to come across and have a go at this kill. And in fact, already the vultures are starting to gather. They've found this kill already. Two white-backed on either side of a hooded, the slightly smaller hooded vulture, patiently waiting for their chance to descend upon the kill. If they were to try now, the lions would defend it fiercely and chase it away. Amazing how fast they managed to find the, this particular carcass. Less than a few hours. And maybe the hyenas will be next on the list of scavengers. Alrighty, well, let's pop over to Scott and let's get an update from what's happening on his side. So, we've decided to move on from those two thirsty lioness and we 
we're not going to go too far and we've got the Juma waterhole camera keeping a very close eye on them so if anything happens we will be sure to race back there and get you in a good spot so we've got that side covered for now and I saw a sounder of warthogs in this little open clearing just before we went live and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to find them they were seeking refuge in the shade under one of these large marula trees, which are the large trees in this clearing. And Andrew's just on the right here. Oh, he's trying to fly away from us. But hopefully we'll be able to get you a glimpse of it. It's the yellow-billed hornbill and it's one of my favorite birds. We were just discussing this morning how they appear to be one of the more friendly of the animals out here, and that's probably because of their cartoon-like appearance. Now, interestingly, it's hunting and looking for little insects or possibly a chameleon. You can see how it's turning its head from side to side to focus on the various parts of this bush willow tree just landed on the ground right next to us. Hello you. Have you got anything between your beak? Oh, you're hunting something small. And sadly, oh no, it's just caught a grasshopper. Maybe we'll be able to see it. Well done, Andrew. Well done, Andrew. Great camera work. And there you can see its kill. And I think this could be an elegant grasshopper. Very bright colorations. You might be able to see better on your big screens than I can on my little monitor, but there's quite a few of these elegant grasshoppers around at the moment. Bright colored and quite large. So there we go. The lions have a kill, the hornbills have just made one, and it's turning out to be an action-packed day here at Juma. And very happy to hear you all enjoyed that wonderful clip that our team of directors and one presenter single-handedly filmed that whole awesome sequence. And Debbie, you just made a comment saying that uh, it could have turned out to be a nasty situation for me who was running nearby. And to be honest, Debbie, I did skip a few heartbeats. When I saw the herd initially running uh, away from the waterhole, they were running south away from it. But there was a small chance that they were going to run between Inga's house and Yuri's house, which are the two landowners' houses, They're a sister and a brother. And that's where I was with just an apple leaf tree that I could have clambered up. So as soon as I saw the dust and heard the hooves stampeding and realized what was going on, I headed straight for this tree. And then they continued south. So I felt safe temporarily and thought, well, let me carry on and do another lap around the clearings. And I was actually running up this road and continuing in the direction of the lions, which is about kind of 500 meters uh, behind us. Um, so once I got kind of a lot closer to where the lions are on that buffalo. I heard the buffalo that they caught bellowing. And then I heard other buffalo coming running through into the clearing. So they had done a very big U-turn from their original direction of movement back onto these clearings. And that's when my heart skipped another beat. And thankfully, Jamie, Nikki, and Kirsty came to my rescue and found me hiding underneath a tree that I was ready to climb up if anything got out of control. But... All exciting stuff, Debbie, and very happy that at least the girls were out to capture some of those wonderful moments for you guys on their phones. And Lynn, you'd like to know if it was Kirsty and Nikki's first uh, live kill that they've been a part of and it certainly was Nikki's first uh, kill of that nature but it wasn't Kirsty's. Kirsty is building up quite a resume of wonderful kills that she's witnessed. The first one was with me following tracks of Karula. We were tracking a female leopard and we found her on foot. She was 
aware of our presence, but we kept a distance from her, and we could see she was hunting something. She was stalking up the bank of this dry riverbed. And I was on the radio calling Jamie into the sighting in the vehicle. And literally, while I was talking to Jamie, telling her to go to Weaver's Nest uh, and, Elef uh, and Pangolin Track Junction, a road junction, where we would then direct to off-road into the block. And as I was talking to her, telling her to go there, I saw Karula pounce. The next thing we knew, she had a steam buck in her mouth. So Kirsty's first kill was on foot. Now that is something that not many people are going to be able to witness in a lifetime of working out here. So Kirsty is a lucky charm that's worth taking on safari with you, I guess. And speaking of good luck, it sounds like you guys are in luck because you're heading across onto Jamie's vehicle as it appears the lions are getting hungry. We are indeed in luck. One of the lionesses has decided to brave the heat and the flies and her very full belly and come to investigate. Looking tentative, I wouldn't say that she's diving with great enthusiasm into her meal. Bless you. Bless you. I'm looking for whether or not she can gather any scraps of the easiest part of the meal to munch, which is around the chest cavity. But I think that has been picked clean. And now she has to consider tackling the difficult job of peeling the skin back from the hind quarters and the fore quarters. Bless you, because you get blood up your nose. And when they yawn like that and they expose those incredible canines, you suddenly find yourself fiercely aware of just what fearsome predators they really can be. Particularly with faces still dabbed with scarlet flashes of blood. Mike, who is bidding us a good afternoon, even though it is good morning for him in Florida. Mike tells us that he was watching the Juma Dam camera when the hunt occurred, just after we finished our sunrise safari. And it was incredible, wasn't it, Mike? I know that the zooming in that particular case did a wonderful job. What's the matter, girl? Can you not decide where you want to eat? What's got your attention? She's trying to find a comfortable spot. The, now, the kill is now in the sun, and she's, I think, feeling very warm. And she's peering up at what looks like she's peering up at the sun to try and figure out where the shady spots would be. Shame, girl, you're so hot. moment the largest irritation to this lioness are the biting flies that are wandering or flying around and attaching themselves to soft and vulnerable parts of the skin you'll notice every now and again they flick their ears irritably or shake their heads and snap at them that's because they're highly intolerant of the flies sitting on them it irritates them and Heidi you're wondering speaking of pests you're saying lions must surely have ticks, so why is it that we never see ox peckers on them? And the answer to that, Heidi, is they do have ticks, definitely, particularly around the more vulnerable groin and under the tail areas. The reason they don't have ox peckers is because they are intolerant of them. They do not enjoy or appreciate having a bird flapping around on them. And I think that's partly to do with their predator senses and their predator reflexes. I think it makes them nervous and distractible. 
and they simply haven't evolved to allow ticks or allow ox peckers to sit on them. And as she munches away on her meal, the other two lionesses are on the move. Let's go have a look. So, thankfully, the Juma Waterhawk can. And the Zumi controlling it did a great job of alerting us to the two lionesses that we were watching earlier getting up and moving. Now, I've seen one lioness, she was further behind us looking down in this direction and I'm just trying to work out where the second one is and if in fact they're not trying to hunt something. Now, even though they're already full bellied and uncomfortably hot, if any potential prey does come nearby they will try and catch it, so I'm just making sure we don't miss out on an opportunity to capture some action. And I'm going to move back up in the direction of where I did last see the one lioness at least. We should be able to find her again shortly. They were lying up just under the, this green bush to our right over there before they got up. That's where we left them. I think from Johannesburg and very very happy to hear that you enjoyed the clip and isn't it exciting that the girls got out to see that awesome action unfolding. Nikki came to me just before I headed out for my run and she said I want to go and see the, the lions. So I said okay well if I thought anything was going to be what was going to happen I'd be sure to be there and she said don't worry I'll take myself and just as well as they did. I obviously felt a little bit awkward after not even finishing my run. I realized that I made the completely wrong decision with buffalo stampede all around me. Now, the other lioness was right here. Okay, here we go, we've got them. Good, so it looks like these two lioness are just up ahead of us now and heading straight back towards the others. One is having a toilet break, so we're not going to make it feel awkward and just leave it be and also make sure we get away from it as quickly as possible. Andrew can't resist filming them in an awkward situations, so he went for it. <laughs> um, to have you on board with us. It sounds like you could be a new viewer and it would be wonderful to know where exactly you are watching. And you mentioned that it's surprising that these lions were actually scared of the water buffalo. And you're right, it is remarkable that they are nervous of their potential prey. But what's important to remember is that these actually are not water buffalo, they're cape buffalo. So that's the first little reminder I'll give you. Look at this just in front of our vehicle, Arthur. How awesome is this? Too good to be true. So water buffalo in India are very large, but they don't have to fall prey to the lions of Africa. The cape buffalo have become incredibly used to it though. And they've also learned how to put up a fight against the buffalo. I mean against the lion, apologies. And they are incredibly large. They've got those very sharp horns. And that's what makes the lion think twice about getting into a wrestle with them. Under cover of darkness or when the whole pride is in unison and has a herd of buffalo turned and running away from them, then they can manage to pounce on them. But even then, Arthur, you would have seen the clip now playing of that single buffalo cow managing to keep five lioness at bay. Here's the other one moving just in front of our vehicle again. Awesome stuff. And 
it looks like this is a slightly younger lioness who's taking a moment to catch her breath panting heavily due to the heat and also due to the fact that she's got quite a lot of buffalo pressing up against her diaphragm causing her to take short breaths her stomach is bulging after a buffalo breakfast and what a great view this is watching them head off towards their pride members with the kill now wicked blues band you've queried as to why could the lioness have not have done like a false attack to try and turn the buffalo well when there's six or seven big buffalo bulls two lioness are simply not going to be able to turn them very quickly even with a false charge those big old boys have seen lion and dismissed lion many 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 times they could be 15 20 years old those big old bulls and they're still alive in an area that is rich with lion and other predators so you need to remember that for them to still be alive they know how to look after themselves and being an animal that big i mean they five six seven times the size of a lioness plus with those big set of horns they know that they can command respect when need be to Midnight Wolf, another new name. And you've asked a good question, which will lead me to be able to let Wicked Blues Band know the reality of the relationship between buffaloes and lions. And you would like to know if they can actually be killed by buffalo. And yes, they can. If not instantaneously, from being gored and crushed by the buffalo's immense powerful horns, they could receive a, 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 an injury that may prove fatal in the future. So they may break a leg or get torn open by those sharp horns. So yes, lions will certainly be killed by buffalo from time to time. I should have showed you, well, let me actually show you quickly where Jamie picked me up from. It was from underneath this tree over to our left. And that's where I was, just under there, when Jamie picked me up this morning. And I was running along that road that you can see in the foreground. And now you're going to get an idea of how close we were to those lions that made the kill. So. The rest of the herd came running through between these two vehicles now, us and Aubrey. He's taking along his Juma guests on safari, and Jamie is literally just ahead of us. Uh, and we'll actually be able to show you where the vultures are perched in the tree above her to give an idea of where we are with regards to where the rest of the pride are. And we're going to have to stay here. There's already a few vehicles in the sighting. And for those of you who are new to Safari Live, there's a limit to three vehicles per sighting. And let's quickly just get a shot of those vultures on that dead tree through the gap over here. And there's a lioness heading straight towards them. And Jamie's in that area with you guys. So we're going to send you onto her vehicle now and we're going to head off and see what else we can find you i hope you have a good time with the lions well scott goes out in search of all kinds of wonders one lioness has decided that actually more food doesn't sound all that appealing to her to have this incredible view of, is that amber eyes? I think that is amber eyes. A lioness, one of the older lioness in the Inkahuma Pride with much, much darker, more orange eyes. There you go, Laura. That is amber eyes, that big yawn. And they've cleaned themselves up nicely after that kill. We've always spoken before about 
Oh, here come the other two lionesses. Here we go. Welcome back, girls. Shame, guys. No water for you. Typical greeting between the different lionesses reunited and rubbing their heads on each other. Oh, this is very interesting. Now this is very curious. So, Amber Eyes responded incredibly aggressively to the sub-adult's greeting. For no clear reason, she wasn't walking up to the kill. Then when the other lioness shamed the sub-adult looked so put out. What happened, girl? And now that I'm seeing them, they definitely haven't eaten as much. The two that were down in Scott definitely haven't eaten as much as the others. Shame, and she got a full-on claw to the face. It's a tough world out here. But I don't, I don't quite understand what prompted that initial charge. It wasn't as though the sub-adult was rushing towards the kill. And I wonder if maybe just a bit of irritability from an aunt rather than a mother or perhaps they've been separated to the point that the bonds are slightly more fractured with the rest of the pride I, I really don't know I have no idea what that was all about your guess is as good as mine and then Amber Eyes as soon as the other lioness showed interest in the kill raced back she's not interested in eating it although this is this is less uncommon I mean this behavior here to be protective over kills and show aggression over kills is not uncommon but to not let the others feed at all um, I'm very confused very very confused what was that all about the girl it can only be about the kill but that was very weird I was expecting the sub adult to go in for the normal headbutt greeting that is fairly typical of lions they're all usually tightly bonded within the pride itself she is feeding now at least there is that but that would explain why the two that were with Scott don't look as well fed and maybe why they were separated because they were decided they were going to go and have a drink instead but that was really interesting thinner the sub-adult is than the adult female. Now, I touched upon it earlier in terms of what percentage of their body weight, well, in answer to Rich, Le Le Rich Levy's question as to how much they eat in one sitting, we wanted to know sort of a rough percentage. And if a lioness can eat about 20 kilograms, of, I mean, that might be a little bit much, let's say 15 kilograms of meat in one sitting, that would put it if she's about 130 kilograms it would be just less than 20 percent so about about let's say 12 percent or 10 percent of their body mass they can consume in one go but a young buffalo between five lionesses i guess doesn't really provide them with as much food as they would like maybe it's because it's a small kill I'm really not sure. Shame. Hey girl, what did you do to make that line so cross? And Donna 
Don and Miller, who's watching in Jackson, you were saying maybe it's as a show of power to show that she's more dominant. And it's entirely possible, Donna. I mean, I guess it was just one of those things that we'll never have a true explanation for. Let's see how the rest of the lions respond to her. Oh, she's not even going to try. She's just going to lie in the shade there. And somewhere off to the right of us is one very angry squirrel that has just realized that the lions are here. A little bit slow on the uptake. <laughs> and he's now furiously shouting down at them. It's just out of our view. who's watching in Florida. You were just saying that you have a new respect for Buffalo, having watched that clip and watched that old female come forward to try and save the youngster. And you were saying you didn't realize how much they cared. And it's actually very common to see a Buffalo fight back in that way. And quite often the whole herd will get involved. And Kat, if I could make a suggestion, not now, during Safari Live, of course, but afterwards, if you'd like to have a look at a video called Battle at Kruger, have a Google and just watch one of the most extraordinary scenes you will ever see. Again, not necessarily for sensitive viewers, although not as graphic as what we witnessed this morning, but it shows you the most incredible interaction between lions and buffalo, and at one point, even a crocodile enters the mix. So I would definitely encourage you to have a look at that. Look how hot they are. And of course now the buffalo at the pan, not just defending each other, but defending the water. calmed down now. They've relaxed once again. We've got this extraordinary view of those fearsome teeth. And the pink tongue. And have a look if you can, although the light might be a bit tricky, but you might even get to see the backwards facing spurs that are on a lion's tongue, much like a rough cat's tongue, but more so or more pronounced in that respect. And they can actually strip meat from the bone with that tongue. And then in the back in the cheeks, the sharp shearing carnassial molars, which act like scissors to slice through meat and to crunch up bits of small bone. And then of course those incredible canines, deeply rooted. The root is as long, if not longer, than the tooth itself, planted firmly in their jaw. A lion skull is one of the most fascinating things to look at, a weapon of nature. And of course, after the mouth, they are also equipped with their battle armor, the claws, or their battle weaponry. The claws also contribute. And that swat that that poor sub-adult received was done with claws out and claws extended. And actually, I noticed that one of the claws hooked in her cheek briefly. Gilly, you were wondering if maybe it has something to do with the relationship, or that aggression has something to do with the relationship with the Birmingham boys. Um, maybe. Maybe it's, it's had the effect of putting them more on edge. Apparently, before that sighting with Brent and the buffalo kill at Buffalo's Hook Dam, apparently the sub-adult was with the rest of the pride, and when the Birmingham boy appeared, she actually fled. She left the area. So perhaps she still hasn't quite settled down and felt secure with the new males, although she's now at the age where they probably shouldn't be showing her any kind of aggression because she'll be ready to mate in the next few months. I don't know, maybe she's coming to estrus or maybe Amber Eyes is coming into estrus and the hormones affecting them. At the end of the day, the wild animals have their own reasons for doing what they do.
looks like she might puke. Oh, she's just getting stuff out of it. Back of her throat. <laughs> I thought there was going to be a quick vomit there, which is not uncommon at these kill sites, especially when they munch bits of bone that then make them uncomfortable. And Safari, I'm so glad that we appear to have you hooked to our live safaris. You were saying that this has been such a great safari so far. And of course, it only has the potential to get better. I've just done a quick test of the wind direction and it's blowing the center of the carcass straight at the hyena den. So who knows what we could be seeing or what scenes might be played out here over the next few hours. I would not be at all surprised if the hyenas decide to wander through. It remains to be seen. The, the lion kill, having chatted a bit about the lion, or the lion kill and its proximity to the hyena den, we're about probably, I'm just trying to do a quick calculation of distance in my head, probably about a kilometer and a half, which is within the range that hyenas can, or are suspected that they can pick up the sense of kills. By a kilometer and a half, that's about three quarters of a mile away from where we are now. So Phil, who was asking a bit about that, and I'm sure many of you were actually wondering about where we are in proximity to the hyena den. And it's also interesting is that, oh, sorry, it was Phil watching in South Carolina. What's also interesting is that the hyenas love quarantine area. This is part of one of their favorite places to come to. Squirrel's still shouting. We know, Mr. Squirrel. We know there's lions here now. A big warm welcome to a new viewer. Danny Garcia, welcome. You wanted to know where we are in the world. Well, right now you're watching a safari come to you live from Juman Arethusa Game Reserves in this Great Asabi area, all of which forms an unfenced or is connected to the Greater Kruger National Park. So we're sitting right up in the northeast corner of South Africa, one of the best places to come and watch the stories of the big predators, the big five, all kinds of things that play out here. But you're wondering specifically why this lion is so tired. A couple of reasons. One, they hunted a buffalo that was about 300 or 400 kilograms in weight and brought it down this morning. And they also had to fight off an attack from an older buffalo. And two, she's just eaten about uh, maybe about 10 kilograms of meat in one sitting. She's essentially overindulged. So she's sitting with a huge belly pressing up against her organs and all of her all of her body processes at the, at the moment are focused on digesting the meat and cooling herself down. That's why she's panting like she is. They've also, the only water that they have access to in, within the immediate kill area is the Voyatella Dam. And the, up there, there is a 24-hour camera that watches the dam, set up to observe all the comings and goings live. And the reason they can't go there for a drink at the moment is because the buffalo seem to be particularly possessive over it. And they don't seem to want to let the lions anywhere near it. And in fact, are at present lying in it. There you go. So we're going to do a quick view of what's happening at the poor lion's only water source and you can have a look at why they are so thirsty at the moment. So there you go. You can understand on this hot, hot day where we are sitting well above 30 degrees, which is somewhere in the 90s Fahrenheit, you can just imagine what it's like. Oh, there's a water bucket. There's a water buck and they've seen it. And they've gone into they've gone into stalk mode. Oh, the water buck's seen them. Is it, are they going to chase it? 
they thinking about it? Oh, it, it hasn't. He hasn't seen them. And they're going for it. I don't believe this. into stalk mode. Waterbuck's completely unaware. This is incredible. Opportunists to the last. The waterbuck has moved out of our view and I can't start the car unfortunately without interrupting their hunt. There you go. Tebs has managed to spot the water back for you. Well done, Tebs. She's going into a trot. There she goes. She stopped. Moving forward again. Stalking. Flat to the ground. Who would have guessed it? This is incredible. As soon as she gives chase, we'll be able to start up and we'll be able to follow on. You can see her panting. She's so hot, so tired, but they can't pass off the opportunity. It's one of the adult females that's initiated this hunt. The others are watching intently. They'll be ready to sprint off if she does catch it. Amazing. Who would have thought? You can see the intention, the focus, even if it is behind the bushes. Tension in every line of her body. Well done, Tibbs. Tibbs doing an excellent job of managing to keep track of her. I don't know where the water buck is. I don't know how far she is from it. But I don't think it's seen her. This is amazing. Tibbs scanning around. Keep your eyes peeled. She went forward to stalk that water back. And I think now she's far enough away that we could reposition. I just want to let the other engine move forward. There's another a well done, Ted's. I think she's coming back. Unsuccessful. Oh, that was fascinating. And it just goes to show how unpredictable these creatures really are. They are opportunists to the last. Panting in hot. That was, I think we were all holding our breath there for a moment. I couldn't actually believe the way that that situation looked like it was about to play out. And I certainly know I was breathing faster. But Miss Jin has raised a very good point. She said if we breathed as humans, as fast as these lions do, we would hyperventilate. So why is it that they don't? Miss Jin, I actually don't know. I'm fairly uncertain in that respect. I do know that there 
hemoglobin is, I'm not sure if it's a slightly higher hemoglobin count, maybe a slightly higher, higher red, blood, 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 blood cell, red blood cell count. So of course the cells responsible for carrying oxygen to the muscles and allowing them to be used in the metabolic processes. Ms. Jen, it's a really good question. I, th I guess they're adapted for it. The lionesses are up now. This is so fascinating. And of course, they can't sweat. Oh, can we just show? He's going to go feed the chicks, Tevs. Our hornbill, I've been watching him all afternoon. He's got a nest there. <laughs> and you can hear the little chicks cheeping and begging. It's somewhere in a crevice there, but with the lions here, I can't go and investigate it fully. That was so cool. What an interesting moment. Okay, and all our lions have started moving up towards, or well not all of them, two of them have moved up towards quarantine. I don't know if they're thinking of heading towards a drink. Thank you very much. A couple of them moved off to go and relieve themselves after a heavy morning of um, eating. Luckily they've decided not to do right next to the carcass. showed a clip of the lion hunt and both Karen and Dylan and I'm sure many others who unfortunately missed that replay you were wondering whether or not we could actually play it again for you and we're not going to now but we will definitely be uploading it onto social media networks as soon as possible and I'm sure it will be shared in the regular usual ways and many of the viewers I'm sure will be able to provide you with links to it. We try and use a very um, judicious use of replay clips because we like to come to, come to you live. It brings an authenticity to it that is unmatched. So we use them only when we abs or absolutely sparingly. <laughs> I'm laughing at Fadda's comment that the waterback lived happily ever after. And yes, it did. I'm not sure whether because the lioness gave up because she was tired or if she gave herself away, but for now, <laughs> the water bug lived happily ever after for now. What an extraordinary moment. Polly, I'm glad you enjoyed the commentary. It's one of those things where you just never know where it's going to take you and what direction it's going to go in. Hey, Lions, you keep us guessing, huh? Very good point. Monique in London, you were wondering why the squirrel, that was alarm calling when the lions walked down here, why it didn't alarm call when the lions were stalking. Oh, look, there you can see a claw sheath. Sorry, Monique. How cool is that? There you can see what I was chatting a bit about that cartilage sheath that retracts into the foot itself. And oh, there it goes, back in, popped back in. That was just a brief opportunity to see that in action. You can imagine the fierceness of that particular claw when it's extended. I'm using it to pull against the carcass and turn it over, demonstrating the raw power. Be quiet for a moment. There's always interesting sounds from feeding lions. Uh, 
What confused me about that aggression earlier was also the fact that they're all well, fairly well fed. Usually the initial aggression around a carcass happens when, when the lions first start to feed and they usually calm down. They might grumble and rumble at each other when they're joined to feed, but not like that. I'm still a bit confused by it. Where was I? Monique, while we enjoy the somewhat gruesome view of the lion's lunch, you were wondering about that squirrel. Um, got interrupted by the claw sheep. I don't know. Maybe the squirrel moved on. Um, maybe he wasn't alarm calling at all at the lions. Maybe it was a bird of prey. And in fact, he hadn't even spotted the lions or had already got used to them. I didn't see a bird of prey and it coincided directly with when the two lionesses came to join the rest of the group that he started shouting. Monica, I honestly don't know. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Maybe his attention was distracted or maybe he decided to leave the area. Maybe his voice was sore, lost his voice from making all that noise. Now, although this, oh, she got the track here. Oof. Um, although this is a fairly gruesome scene for us to watch, at least this carcass is fresh and thus for Tebs and myself doesn't come with the quite the odour that a four-day-old buffalo kill does. And Charlotte, who's watching in PE, you were wondering when the carcasses become infested with maggots, will the lions eat them and do they do anything to their digestive system? Ooh, yummy. Mmm. Head right in the kill there, stripping the connective tissue. Uh, Charlotte, yes they do. They eat carcasses infested with maggots and in fact we've watched the Nkuhuma lionesses sit with one of the most rotten buffalo I have ever sat with. The maggots were streaming in waterfalls through the carcass and they were still munching on it and eating it. I must say that that smell was probably one of the worst scents I have ever experienced in my life and Viam and myself had a couple of moments so did Jandre and I actually when Jandre was on camera. They do eat them, uh, they don't deliberately set out to eat them but when they are consuming the meat they will automatically consume them as well. It doesn't affect them negatively, the stomach acid simply dissolves them and it adds maybe a little bit of extra protein. Not as much as the carcass itself does though, there she's using her spiked or spurred tongue to help her lift up some of the meat so that her teeth can get a grip. Uh, keep your eyes on the Juma Dam camera as well because uh, we're still missing two lionesses from this particular group. And while they munch on their grisly meal of buffalo, I believe that Scott has found one of their other favorite prey species. Well, thankfully for this zebra stallion, he's not too close to the lion. And as you are now well aware, even when they have a kill and are full-bellied, they'll still take any opportunity that presents itself. Luckily, the waterbuck got away this time. I wonder why he's all alone. It's not hugely common to find zebra stallions alone. You usually find them in small bachelor herds or with their harem of ladies. And unlike a lot of the men out here, they stick with their ladies through thick and thin and fight for them throughout the year. Whereas a lot of the males will only compete for females when they know there's something to gain. And by that, I mean the females are in season. But zebras are different. They have a harem structure. Maybe his harem is nearby. But usually they're always in eyesight of one another. So maybe he's been recently ousted and all of his ladies stolen by a, by a younger stallion he does appear to be in great condition though so not too sure what's going on let's creep a little bit further forward and see if we can't find any more obviously it's very thick bush on either side of this road Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> wow. Hello, Jen B, and I appreciate your humor. You just mentioned that you would have thought somebody of my experience in the bush would know that it's not the right thing to do. Well, the last thing you should do is run. And there I was running amongst buffalo and lions. So thanks for your humor. I obviously wasn't running away from them, and that is the key to remember. You are just going to die out of breath if you decide to try and run away from almost all of the animals out here because they will catch you. That's a great go away bird calling in the background. Aptly named because it sound, sounds like it's saying, go away. And very useful indicator species because they can often shout that very same call at animals like lion and leopard. And very useful for an animal like a zebra or impala who are feeding nearby that go away bird. As soon as they hear that alarm, they're gonna be on extra high alerts. Well, the zebra's moved off into some thick bush, so we're going to send you back to Jamie, and we're making our way back to that waterhole. There's a chance I think some of those lions may come for a drink. So we're going to ready ourselves there, and we'll give you an update when we're a little bit closer by. Lioness continues her grizzly meal, and you can see now how she's using those back teeth to shear what is incredibly tough connective tissue holding the meat in place. And they actually have to work very hard at this point in the kill to really get the most out of it. Okay, and she's using the more powerful molars to slice through. She can't really tug as much with her canines, not to the same extent. It's what those molars are built for. And if I'm quiet for a moment, you'll be able to hear the crunching. Is watching in Los Angeles, you were wondering why it is these animals seem to be so unconcerned by our presence. And it's largely because they're incredibly comfortable with cars over years and years and years of habituation. So I'm talking at least 30 to 40 years that they've been viewed by guests in open vehicles. And we also, at the same time, it's largely because of ethical approaches to them so not driving into their personal space not making too much noise you'll notice i'm keeping my voice down not making too much noise around them and just trying to keep our level of disturbance down as much as possible all these lions however old they might be and i'm not sure as to their exact ages i know two of the females are probably about at least seven or eight the younger females are probably about five or so and the sub-adult, of course, is around two. But for all of them, they will have, from the tiniest age, from when they were first cubs, they will have experienced game viewers watching them and keeping an eye on them. And Danny Garcia, you were wondering a little bit more, you were wanting a bit more detail about the way that animals view people in the vehicle and the fact that they see the vehicle as a unit. And we're wondering if they, if you put a zebra in the vehicle, if it would still see it as a unit. And it's an interesting one. It's one of those things that I've often tossed up in my head. I know that lions, when they walk past you in the car, I know that they look at individuals. So they know that there are people in there, but they are used to the way that the people are shaped when they sit in the vehicle, and that makes them feel secure. But if, for example, Tebs, who's sitting out behind me, operating the camera and bringing you these sterling images, I know that if he were to stand up, or if I were to stand up, 
wave my arms or raise my hat up in the air, that immediately breaks the line. But never mind that, something's happening at the waterhole. So we've literally just arrived at the waterhole, Andrew Go White, um, and there's quite a few Cape Buffalo chasing off possibly the same two lionesses earlier. We've got a wonderful low angle here. And look at these shots. Absolutely awesome. Uh, I'm guessing that these buffalo may decide to actually head off from here. I'm going to reposition quickly. happening here. So the water was just beyond these little logs to our right. And these poor lioness are desperately thirsty, but the buffalo are not giving them a chance to quench their thirst. However, I do feel that these buffalo are going to continue off away from the water all now. They only like to spend the hotter hours of the day there. And now we're going to head off in search of some food. And I wonder what these lioness plan to do. They may know of another waterhole nearby, the Ganago waterhole, which they may head to. Although this one looks like she's going to come and take a chance. And I think she is going to get a spot to drink here. So I'm going to reposition, get ready for that. We're going to get some great views. about eye level. There go some hardy doll ibises. They have been chased off with the Juma camp in the background. And it looks like the lioness can finally quench their thirst. Look at this, what an awesome low angle. Interestingly, the other lioness is heading straight past the final control room. That's a little fence that keeps the Vuitella guests safe. And that little room, you can see a white panel there. That's a huge satellite dish that helps get the picture to you guys, I think. So one lioness is heading there, the other one's drinking here. It's all happening here. Interesting behavior with you guys and those lioness back with Jamie and all of the growling that's been going on there. So action packed. Even this lion is chasing these hardy to ibis. Yeah, the Cape bu Buffalo are not too sure what to do now. They're kind of standing around wondering what their next move should be. And Mimi who's just 15 years old, is interested to know if the lions need to drink or if they can get water simply from their kills. As she was under the impression that they could get enough liquid simply from their kills. And Mimi, in areas where water is very scarce, yes, the lion there may be able to make do with just the water or the liquid rather and moisture from their kills. But all other lion that I've seen in regular areas where they do have water, they do need to drink almost daily. Or they like to drink daily. They maybe don't need to, but they like to. So only very specialized lions in desert areas will be able to go for days without water and only rely on their food. But it's more common that lion actually do like drinking. There come the buffalo. This is awesome. There goes the hardy to ibis, the ripple effect. Of the buffalo chasing the lion, the lion chasing the hardy dar. I can't see where.
where the other lioness has gone. I think she is still up and around FC. Oh, yeah, I've just spotted her again. So she looks like she's making her way back down here. But the buffalo haven't given up yet. And even though I thought they would have, look at the ox pick, a little bird sitting on the buffalo's back as it chases the lion away. As if nothing's happening, just there for the ride, there for moral support. The other one's got a whole bunch of ox peckers spectating. And here goes the lioness. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Beautiful sunlight cast onto her now. I think she may be able to sneak around the back of our vehicle and maybe try and have another drink. You may see one or two of the other vehicles in shop also enjoying this wonderful sighting with us. And yeah, I think the lioness is going to be able to have another drink from this little puddle next to us. But probably not for too long because the buffalo are regrouping and planning their next attack. And the lioness is not taking any chance. And then, Andrew, maybe you can go back to the lioness who's coming back down into the clearing beyond these lions. Difficult to know where to form. Look at how awesome these shots are. Here comes the other lioness. And the one that disappeared behind our vehicle is, looks like she's going to lie down in the shade. So she's at least managed to quench her third thirst. The other one who gave up has yet to. So that's the one we can see returning now. And the buffalo are probably going to get quite a big surprise when they see her returning. Oh, it looks like one of them may have spotted her. Well, it's not often we get to show you views like this in a nice open clearing, lion and buffalo pacing around one another. We have been absolutely spoiled rotten this afternoon. I'm not sure if you can hear the squirrels chattering away frantically. Quite a way off and it's quite windy, so you may not be picking up that audio, but the squirrels have been shouting non-stop since these lions arrived around the waterhole. And sadly, I think there's just too much ambient noise being picked up by the wind or caused by the wind. Good, well, we're going to need to reposition and see what these lions are doing. I fear, feel like they are going to probably be sleeping in the shade for the time being. So you guys are going to jump back onto Jamie's vehicle and see what's happening over there. Moving from a situation where the buffalo were victorious to a situation where they sadly were not, the females have taken the opportunity to come and feed while Amber Eyes and the other female have gone to try and get a drink. There was a bit of growling, huffing and puffing a bit earlier as they all tried to squeeze around the best part of the kill, but they found their designated sides now and all is calm again. They've flipped the calf over completely now, but earlier we had a view of the trachea descending through the thoracic cavity. And Charlie, you were fascinated by that. And what you noted was how enormous it is. And you were wondering if that's because of the large buffalo lung capacity. And yes, essentially that is. I mean, there are big animals, even at the sub-adult size, it would have been a couple of hundred kilograms. So to have plenty of oxygen or the capacity to bring oxygen into the large lungs is an essential aspect of being able to keep the buffalo going when they need to run away from a hunt like the one that happened this morning. Now, interestingly, buffalo are one of the animals that suffer the most from tuberculosis or 
are most common carriers of tuberculosis, but because of their large resilient lungs and their large body size, as well as the fact that it's a naturally occurring disease, we actually find that whilst most of them carry it, very few of them are seriously affected by it until they reach the older ages and they start to weaken their, and their immune system starts to weaken. But tracheas are always fascinating things, reinforced by cartilage rings all the way through, not collapsible like the esophagus that would have been pulled out at some point at the start of this kill. And of course the stomach contents avoided completely, but the lungs with their complete their pleural membranes and all of that blood supply around them to allow for the gaseous exchange, they are incredibly nutrient rich. And at the start of the kill, it would have been absolute chaos watching them trying to fight their way for the lungs or the livers, or not the livers, they only have one liver, sorry, liver or kidneys, all of the most nutritious parts of the carcass. Bunch around, Scott is still with his lines and they're on the move. So the lion is well, still battling it out with these Cape Buffalo and there's a tiny little overflow that the one lioness is trying to drink out of. It's probably not the tastiest of what's in very muddy, I'm guessing, but better than nothing and that's all they can get while these buffalo keep them at bay from the water's edge. And isn't this just fascinating to witness? Two eternal en en enemies, meters away from one another. The lions actually killed the buffalo this morning, so that we can't forget. And now the very same species is preventing the lion from washing down the thirst caused by feeding on one of their own. So Hello, Anne, in Texas. And you're wondering whether or not we can distinguish between lions by looking at their whisker spots, just like you do with leopards. And you can, but it's not nearly as easy. The leopards have got far more distinctive and characteristic markings as opposed to the lion. I'm just going to try and reposition the vehicle quickly. This is a great opportunity to try and get some VR footage with the 360 degree camera. So let's wait right here. We are quite close, but that's necessary. I need to just let off a little clap. And that should work. So now we have these Cape Buffalo all around the lion. There's two lioness to our right. All the buffalo straight ahead and one quite close by nearby. Now, I am narrating for the VR rig, so Andrew, you don't have to try and keep up with me, otherwise you're gonna have your work. And I'll check on the buffalo on the right, chasing the line straight past us. And wasn't that incredible? Dust kicked up by the line, and the buffalo continued to stand their ground at the water's edge too good that's gonna make for a good video so i'm glad we got that rig on in time ah! well, hardy the eye was calling in the background the, the lions have as you can see relaxed behind us now to the right Whew. and how long will this backwards and forwards continue for only time will tell but what i can assure you is that we are not going to be going anywhere so you are though, you're gonna be going to Jamie quickly, but as soon as things heat up here again, we'll call you back. And 
what incredible dynamics we have had the opportunity to witness in this or on this sunset safari. Our lines still making sure they get the most out of the looks like they're targeting the pelvis and then the leg joints. Awesome to witness. And the sound effects are also adding to the intensity of a sighting like this. The crunching of the bones. Just have a look at those teeth slicing around the bone before she stops to lick and have a look at it again. Crunch around. And although they don't have the same crushing power that hyenas do, they are able to consume small bones quite easily and often chew around and ingest some of the bones around the edges. <coughs> and that also adds to their calcium intake. And quite often with lion scat, just like hyena scat, it actually starts to turn white in cases where they've consumed a lot of the carcass. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, a small buffalo like this is not going to keep them very full for very long. So a large dugger boy could keep them well fed for four days. As they consume as much as possible. Keith, you were wondering how much of the kill they will consume before they abandon it. And they will consume as much as they can. They're not quite as efficient as hyenas at getting the most out of the kill, but they will pretty much finish all of the meat that they can get to, or all of the muscles. They'll leave the skin and the bones for the scavenging vultures and hyenas. And Keith, it's just a matter of the circumstances because if the clan unites this tonight and descends in large numbers, we know that there's at least at least 10 or 15 adult hyenas in this area. And there could well be more, for all we know. We only really get to see the individuals around the den sites. If they call to each other and unify, it could be that the lions are kicked off this buffalo kill before they've finished every part of it. I think what we can guarantee is that by tomorrow morning, these lions will be on the move again. And Raid Freak, who is watching on YouTube, we were just commenting on the bite force of these lions. And it is incredible, watching the power of their jaw, those huge cheek muscles and the muscles around the top of the skull. And having seen lion skulls before, you can see all of the ridges and the grooves where those tendons attach and help to unify the entire structure. And it just is such a powerful reminder of what incredible predators they are. And such opportunists as well to go walking forwards to stalk that water back, even though they have a buffalo already down and partially consumed and very full bellies. And don't forget, for those of you watching, and especially for those of you joining us for the first time on YouTube, this is coming to you live. So it's happening as you're watching it. We're getting your questions through as you ask them and we are responding them to teach you more about what it is that you're seeing. And the joy, of course, about the fact that it is live is that we never know, and you never know, what's going to happen next. It could always come as a surprise, and it has, the last few days, have provided us with some of the most amazing moments that I have ever had since I started doing these live safaris wild dogs running through into a hyena den, leopards surprising us by popping out of bushes. Deja, who's watching in Florida, you were wondering if the hyenas do decide to come here, 
if they come and join this particular kill and try and steal it away from the lionesses, you'll wonder if they will run that lionesses off it. And as I said, it depends on the numbers. Two or three hyena are not going to be able to make an impact, although they might be able to steal a bit of the leg or something similar if they are courageous enough to risk it. But if more than that starts to join, if we're looking at numbers of 10 to 15, and we start to really have a distinct possibility that we're going to see some incredible interpredator conflict. Now, without a male here, they do not have as much of a defense system as the rest. Speaking of defense systems and conflict with other animals, it seems as though Scots lions have finally made it to some water. Wow, the one lioness on the left of the screen here is quenching her thirst and the buffalo appear that they have not come to terms with the fact that these thirsty lions are going to keep persisting until they get lucky and i can't tell if this is the one that didn't get a drink earlier on i'm guessing it is because she's trying that much harder the buffalo chewing the cud and Tatiana a new viewer great to have you with us you'd like to know if there's times of the day where it's more likely to see good action and yes most certainly the early mornings and late evenings are the best times to be out on safari it does vary though and sometimes the middle of the day can be good if you had a water hole for example because that's when the animals come down to quench their thirst but there are very many variables out here, and as you can see right now, there's some animals quenching their thirst. The other lioness is just off to, to our right. That looks like she's just got a thorn in her foot that she's busy trying to pluck out. And Barbara has also mentioned that it is quite strange that these full-bellied lions are active during the heat of the day. Here comes the other lioness behind us to the right. And there's some other people also enjoying the sighting with us and she's going to join the lioness that's drinking. Now this may cause the buffalo to react, but let's wait and see if the two of them here don't incite a little bit more aggression from these Cape buffalo. Thanks for sending through your questions, Tatiana and Barbara, your observation. And it is interesting that these lions have been so active on this hot day. But I guess that's directly linked to the heat, causing them to be that much more thirsty and that much more willing to move and try and quench their thirst. Crystal Freeze, you'd like to know where Peter, the hippo, who used to frequent this pond almost daily is, and we are not too sure where he's disappeared to, he may have found a bigger pond elsewhere, filled with some lady hippos to keep him entertained, but we aren't sure, what I am guessing is that the um, hippo that died tortured to the east of us is not the same hippo that was here the timing wasn't right that hippo died i think while we were still viewing peter if i remember correctly so i think he is still alive but we can't be certain of where he has gone sadly well these lions are really getting comfortable now and who would have thought they are just so close to these buffalo and everyone seems to have come to terms with the proximity they are to one another. And 
nice of you guys to get a slightly different view from the Juma Waterhall cam. And now Andrew's going to show you exactly where it is in relation to us. And whoever the zoomy is today, or during this period of action, you are seriously lucky and well deserved because you guys do spend hours daily hoping for action like this to unfold. So I'm glad that it is finally happening right here at the water hole that has not seen lion for quite some time. Hard to believe that another buffalo is getting comfortable enough to actually consider having one last wallow in the cool mud. And the lioness, you can understand by the amount of time that they've been drinking for now, seriously needed this little thirst quencher. Kevin and apologies that you missed the action as did all of us really and not even Jamie or Nikki or Kirsty who were closer than anyone to these lions while they were chasing the buffalo actually got to see the takedown and trust me if I had any inclination that these lioness were going to bring down a buffalo we would have extended the drive and Jamie and I felt strongly that it was a stalemate. And I guess that's just a lesson learned. You can never tell what's going on here. But trust me, if we knew that it was going to happen, we would have stayed. We, we had no idea that this was going to be the case. And it was just Nikki, the director actually, who asked Jamie to take her and Kirsty out after being stuck in the control room the whole day. And I'm glad they did go out and catch the back end of some action. But please don't feel like we avoided this action purposefully because that is certainly not the case. to Chantal who would now like to know my thoughts of what would happen if Peter the hippo was here. There go the lion now finally straight past yours and his guests so I'm glad they're getting some good views. Sadly our vehicle's probably in the way of yours's pictures um, but that was great. Um, what would happen if the hippo was in the water hole? I think it would probably chase the lions off a little bit more venomously than these buffalo uh, have relaxed to the degree that they have now. So I think, yes, the, the hippo would have been less tolerant of the lions. But again, my predictions are often wrong, as they were this morning, predicting that the lions were going to do nothing. And that's why a lot of these hypothetical questions that everybody wants to know the answers to, understandably, but nobody does know the answer to them because each situation will vary and you can put a hundred of the same different scenarios together with lion versus buffalo and you're going to get different results each and every time sometimes the lion will win sometimes the buffalo will win and you know it varies greatly so even the same species versus the same species will result in different results. So I'm just going to stop here. These two lioness are heading straight back towards the kill now. And it'll be interesting to see if they don't have a tag team with the other three that haven't been able to come for a drink. Because it would be very useful for some of the lions to remain at the kill to keep those vultures at bay, as well as to keep any scavenging hyena away. Okay, 
let's reposition and loop ahead. Kevin, happy to hear we're on the same page now, and we will get lucky eventually. Um, like I said, we spend so much time, so much more time than you actually, with sleeping lions and sleeping leopards. You often get taken across to the other vehicle while we sit there scratching our heads. Um, so trust me, uh, me more than anyone wants to see action after investing many, many an hour of my life with sleeping cats. <laughs> Good. Well, we're going to try and get you some more good views of these two, but while we do, we're going to send you back to Jamie. Oh, good place. You get a chance to pop in here with you tomorrow. Sorry, guys, I'll be with you in one moment. Just having a conversation on the Game Drive channel. Copy that. Thanks very much. I know it does interrupt my signal ever so slightly, but just letting one of the Buffalook landowners know that there are lions here on a buffalo kill. And she's just dragged it further into the bush. I'm going to reposition a little bit so we can get another view of her in this glorious afternoon light. And won't it be so interesting to see whether or not the lions do tag team and the rest of them have a chance to go and drink. I know that they're on their way back to us now. Hello, gorgeous. This light is incredible. Absolutely stunning. Look at those eyes in that gorgeous evening light. And apparently Scott has also got lions on the move in beautiful light as well. So let's have a look at them. So we're just waiting patiently for these ladies to get into a spot where we can loop ahead of them, but still enjoying these wonderful views following after them. Perfect afternoon sunlight and what's been an absolutely wonderful afternoon so far. And the beauty of it is, is that it's not over yet and there's still quite a long time left on safari. So. Who knows what will happen next. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to follow these two lioness in to where the kill is in case there's a bit more aggression shown between them. Interesting stuff, this aggression between the ladies. Kind of hard to explain. And what's been tricky is that we haven't seen them for quite some time now, so difficult to know what's been going on with them socially. But sometimes it's not nice to know every single move that they make and simply to enjoy the behavior that is happening in front of you without having to explain why and just be able to enjoy their aggression and movements. to Kathy Ward in Memphis, Tennessee, and you'd like to know what is the makeup of the Pride at the moment, and as far as we know, look at this, she's coming straight in front of the vehicle again. As far as we know, there's five of them at the moment, five lioness, and we're not too sure where Junior's gone. So he was the sixth and final member. A few of the other lioness were killed earlier this year, sadly or late last year rather, but at least there they are, these five that are left. And here comes the second one on the same path as the first. Awesome, awesome stuff. And happy that you girls managed to get a drink eventually after getting shown up by those buffalo. And now I'm sure you're looking forward to a little bit more buffalo to chew on rather than be chased by. Well, that was awesome. Off they go and we can continue following them now. Probably about 
a quarter of a mile until they get to the Buffalo Kill. Maybe not that much, maybe just under that. Good. You'd like to know when last was a lion cub born. And the Sticks Lioness had some cubs maybe in August, October. Um, other than that, I'm not too sure. The Inkuhuma Lioness haven't given birth to any cubs for quite some time now. Um, it's been a while, Safari. And even those few cubs that were being raised by the six lioness didn't last very long they were killed by the matimba male uh, so not the matimba males the birmingham males as they came through and started establishing their territory here they chased off the matimba males so overdue for lion cubs as well as leopard cubs but that's fine because on safari you can gain credits and that's what we've been doing for the last year basically gaining cub credits and we're going to cash in soon hopefully these lioness have been seen flirting and a little bit of attempted mating with the birmingham boys it's possible that they have even actually had some successful mating that we haven't seen and hopefully they're pregnant possibly all five of them could be pregnant and imagine how awesome that will be if all five of them give birth to two or three cubs, then we'll be smiling. What I'm thinking of doing is actually looping ahead and maybe getting into the position of the kill with this VR rig in case there is some commotion between these lions when they return and maybe Jamie can make her way out and film them returning. That way we'll be using our tools more effectively this VR rig is going to be more effective in and around the kill. So, that's the plan. And the lioness is just off to our right now, still making their way to the kill, and they'll be with us shortly there. So, let's just head straight in and get into a good spot. and the lion with the kill. Probably just going to wait somewhere right here. Where you can see a fair amount of what's going on. Hello everyone. Hello Jamie, hello nice Tibbs. Nice to see you. How are you guys doing? I hear you guys have been having an amazing... Yes, it's been a, a crazy, crazy Hello. afternoon so far. These other lioness are just approaching now. So I'm thinking maybe I should just reposition once more to get into a good spot for this VR rig. And why don't you guys jump onto Jamie's vehicles while I get in position. <laughs> well, Scott repositions. We're going to shift around to get the approaching lionesses. Hey, Scotty, you started the best view in the house, eh? Sorry, it's all good. Let's go see where they Here come the lionesses. Let's see if there's any of that repeated aggression that we saw earlier try and get a view of both the lions coming in and the lions still here and lying down. Who she would decide to go to? She might actually be going straight towards the kill. She's ignoring the other lioness. I 
think she's going to come around the back. I think Scott's going to get some amazing stuff for that VR rig. Looks like Amber Eyes. You've come at a good time, and sorry that you've lost Jamie's signal, and sorry to barge you out of the best spot, but we needed to get into a good spot for this VR rig, and that we have done in perfect timing. Let's see what happens as this lioness gets closer to the carcass. Already the growling will start, I think. There you heard a few deep pants. But there's still enough meat for them to each kind of have their own spots on the carcass without too much aggression being needed. If a third lioness comes to the dinner table, that will change. And I was really surprised to hear that the one lioness attacked the other, not even whilst feeding on the carcass. So anything is possible. Um, I guess that's the main lesson learned today, at least it was for Jamie and myself. You can just never predict what's going to happen out here. Well, it looks like the other lioness... Oh, no, she's changed, changed her mind. No, she is going to lie down. So the other lioness who quenched her thirst has also just lay down in the background there. And for now, it looks like the carcass is going to be peacefully consumed for the time being, but that could change. And all we need is one or two more lioness to get a little bit hungry and come in, and then they're gonna start jostling for the best spots. Sadly, Jamie's vehicle is having signal problems. I feel terrible that we booted her out of the best spot here, but it was in the best interest of getting some good shots on this VR rig. And that's not for my own personal benefit. It's for everyone's. So She's going to go off and hopefully the tech guys can tinker with her vehicle and work out why she is losing signal here. She shouldn't be, so they've got some work ahead of them. So all of you who are wondering where this virtual reality 360 degree footage is going at the moment, it's all being stitched together and just kept in a place where I actually don't know, to be honest. We just get told to get the footage and then send it off to Johannesburg. So, James, um, it's not being uh, put out onto the internet. There's no way really to see it other than, I think, one clip of Jamie with an elephant. Um, other than that, though, we're just trying to get as much footage as possible. And what exactly is being done with it, I am not too sure. Um, but there are obviously big plans, and as soon as we know where you can watch that footage, we will be sure to let you know. So just bear with us there, please. to Diane, who's just said that there's over 3,000 people watching between the Nat Geo channel, or website rather, and YouTube, and that's great news, but in my mind, still a tiny, tiny number, considering everyone in the world can watch this for free. So it is good, and we are happy, but we need more people. So keep spreading the word, otherwise we're not going to be able to take you to as many places as we'd like to. So the sooner we get that going, the better for all of us.
But I guess what we do need to remember, Diane, is that usually a safari vehicle will have six people on it, a maximum of ten. And the fact that we've got 300 times the maximum amount per vehicle means that we are way ahead of everyone else on safari, and it certainly is a state of the more the merrier. And it's wonderful to have you all with us. I'm just a bit greedy, and want more. Again, Genevieve in New York, who realizes and acknowledges that it is a drought at the moment, but at least it's raining cats. And you're right, it's been quite a while now that the Safari Live crew have been waiting patiently for the lion to get in front of the cameras for us, and finally they have, and they are doing a great job at it. Interesting that the one lioness has come and lay next to the carcass, but with no intentions of feeding on it. So, just wanting to be in pole position. Listen to those bone crunching jaws. What's going to happen here? Just needed to clap to sync the VR rig. That's what that little noise was. And we may see a little bit more aggression now that this other lioness is getting a bit closer. Now, I'm not too sure when they're going to finish off this carcass. Possibly tonight or maybe in the early hours of tomorrow morning. And Andy and Julia in Los Angeles are interested to know how long will this buffalo sustain them once they have finished feeding on it. And a full belly will last them kind of three to five days as a general rule. That's not to say that they won't catch another buffalo tonight if the opportunity presents itself, but they could easily survive for five days, even longer, probably a week between this meal and their next. So they're used to kind of bulk feeding and intermittent meals. They don't need to feed daily, that's for certain. And we need to remember that it's extremely difficult for them to catch their prey. Even though they're incredible hunters, their prey has evolved over many, many years to avoid being eaten. And does a good job at doing that. forward to your grades and the completed research that you've been doing on this pride of lion, the Inkohuma pride. And Sarah, who's just 17 years old, has watched every single live drive where these lions featured, as well as done extra uh, kind of background research into their history. And we look forward to hearing more about this project of yours, Sarah, because I'm sure we could all learn a thing or two from you. It must have taken you hours to watch all the live drives with them, and I'm sure you saw some really cool stuff along the way. We used to see them very, very often when I first arrived here in November 2014, and basically up until the Birmingham boys arrived. Then they bombshelled, as did most lions in the general area. 
and those five marauding males did what most marauding males do. They create huge unrest. They kill cubs. They even kill lioness. And then everything calms down again. And then they'll start to make friends and start to mate with that coalition and accept them as the dominant males of their territory. Gracie, who's just eight years old, also in Ohio, has been telling as many people as she can about Safari Live, and she's been so proud of Safari Live and believes in it so much that she rates it well above chocolate donuts and strawberry milkshakes. And Gracie, you keep spreading the word, and we'll keep taking you on Safari. I think that's a good deal, and thank you for all your help. Let's take on a bit of a tour around the general area. Nothing directly in front of us to see. But interestingly, Karula, we had further down this little pathway about a week ago, lying down there. That was on my first drive back. Now, up there, we have the vultures silhouetted on a dead acacia tree. Beautiful sky beyond them. Interestingly, this is going to be a very good opportunity to show you the difference between the white-backed vultures and the hooded vultures. Now, on the far left, when that vulture turns its head around, look at how thin its little beak is. Tiny for doing the final cleanup of whatever little bits and pieces the slightly bigger white-backed vultures, which are all to the right of it, can't get to. And there's even a few bigger vultures than the white-backed vultures called the lappet-faced and the white-headed vulture that are kind of the bulk feeders that are bigger and more capable of tearing open carcasses. The white-backed is the most common here. So two different species here. And I'm just going to try and have a look at the one on the top right. It appears like... Well, that's quite interesting. Now, it's hard to see, but the one on the top right, you can see the portion of its crop extending out of the middle of its chest. And as Andrew t tweaks the lighting there, you may notice that little blob in the middle of its chest. Now, that indicates that this vulture may have already been feeding today because that's kind of an extra storage pouch. It looks to be quite full, so who knows where that vulture would have had a meal earlier on. What a beautiful view it is. Hello, Susan. You would like to know if the vultures get enough liquid from the food they feed on, just like the question earlier about the lions, or whether they need to drink water, and I guess a similar answer will be applicable. Vultures in very dry areas will make do with the liquid received from feeding on carcasses but they will definitely drink where they can. And not only drink, they'll also bathe themselves. Now, being a vulture can be quite a messy affair. And bathing is necessary, and therefore they seek out water, not only for drinking, but also for cleaning themselves after being in muddy, car uh, muddy bloody rather carcasses. It's not uncommon for vultures to climb entire inside a carcass, so the entire body will be inside the cavity of maybe a buffalo, or a rhino or an elephant, and they come out dripping wet, covered in blood, looking absolutely terrible. So they do need water in their lives, there's no doubt about that. Interestingly, two of the other lionesses have headed off towards the waterhole, it looks like. I can't see, oh no, it looks like they're coming back. So they, if you just zoom in on that termite mound there, Andrew, it'll pop out into frame. There we go, if you just wait there, it's coming towards you, I feel, unless it stopped there, no? it looks like it may have stopped. You can see a caramel blur behind the bush, so it looks like it may be lying down. I thought the other two may be going to take their turn to go and have a drink of water.
Well, it's Michael in New York. You are interested to know where our drone has gone, and it's sitting patiently waiting for more staff and a third vehicle to be up and running before we can get it back up into the sky and sending a live feed to you. So that's, that's the problem we're facing. We've only got two vehicles. One is at the health spa, and we don't have enough staff at the moment to get everything up and running. What you need to understand, and it's something we hope to change in the future, but the Nat Geo TV broadcasts require huge manpower to be able to get all those feeds to you simultaneously. The two vehicles, the drone, the bushwalk, and the safari tent, five different feeds, and it requires every single member of our crew to be here, nobody on leave, and now people are catching up on all that extra time spent at work, so apologies, and hopefully it won't be too long before we get that drone back out there. I love it, as does Andrew, who I'm teamed up with on camera today. He is the official drone squadron commander. Happy to hear that the father is watching. How's it, Dad? How are you doing? Hope all is well. And you would like to know when do I think the hyena will, will arrive? And to be honest, I think it could be a little bit after we've finished the safari, if at all. Now, the hyena in this area usually don't cause too much trouble with the lion. They tend to seek out leopard for easier meals. But that may have changed over the, the last few weeks or months that we haven't actually had lions around. So let's wait and see. It is cooling down. And at this stage of the evening, the hyena will be on the move. And we might get lucky with one coming, snooping around to see if it can't get an easy meal. But to be honest, I'm not feeling hugely confident. Good to know you're watching. Say hello to mom, who I'm sure is not too far from you. And we will probably chat a little bit later. to Lisa in Idaho and you would like to know if the vultures would make the lions aware of any approaching hyena and no they wouldn't um, they probably wouldn't even flinch it's of no kind of concern to them whether the lion are feeding on the carcass or the hyena are feeding on the carcass and therefore won't get involved um, what they want is both the lion and the hyena to leave and that is when they can come down and feed peacefully. As long as they are hyena and or lion, they will continue to chase the vultures away. Unless, of course, they get a little bit lazy in the heat of the day, maybe fall asleep, some vultures might sneak in, get a few mouthfuls, but lion, hyena, and even leopard will continually chase vultures off their kills until they've finished on the main kind of portions of meat that they're happy to feed on and discard the kill entirely. That's when the vultures come down and do the final process of cleaning up the carcass. Hello to Linda, who sent through a question on Twitter using the hashtag Safari Live. Well, oh, look at all those flies, Linda. That doesn't look very appetizing, does it? Linda's interested to know if the vultures will feed on the bones. And no, they are not capable of feeding on bone. They will feed on entirely meat and meat alone. But because of their little beaks and small heads, they can get to portions of the carcass that the lions can't get to, like the meat between all those rib bones. If we come back here tomorrow, we will see those rib bones glistening individually with no meat between them. And if you want to get an idea of just how it happens, there is a video on my Facebook page, Scott Dyson Safaris, that shows the kudu carcass 
that vultures finished off after quarantine. The young male leopard had finished his fill, and uh, some hyena actually also cashed in on that meal. Um, so check out that video if you want to get an idea of how the carcasses are stripped clean by vultures. It's called Dave and Alan on Safari. Quite good fun. You'll also be able to take a short flight with the vultures up in the sky with the drone. Andrew was thankfully alongside us on that little mid-morning mission. We went out between drives and found a leopard on a kill. And Linda, it's the hyena that is the, the bone cruncher of the African wilderness. Lion and leopard are capable of feeding on certain bones, but the hyenas are the king of crunching and they have got the most powerful jaws as well as digestive system which is designed to crush and then dissolve that bone the hyena dung comes out pure white and is one of the only animals that can digest digest bone as well as they do to Patrick in Arizona and you would like to know how much bigger is an African lion than an American mountain lion and I would say probably about three times the size on average a lioness will weigh on average 120 kilograms about 240 pounds whereas your average mountain lion will probably weigh about 40 kilograms or about 80 pounds now what's interesting is depending on the area you're in sizes of all these animals will vary quite greatly and the same goes for leopard and the same will go for mountain lion so i guess it depends but that was just a guess on my behalf i'm not sure of the exact weights of mountain lion and i'm sure some of you will double check me but i'm confident it's around the 40 kilogram mark quite similar to that of a leopard or female leopard maybe the big male mountain lions will be a bit bigger Very happy to hear that Jamie is back up and running. So why don't you guys go over and say hello to her and console with her poor tech issues and also send her an apology from me for booting her out of the best spots at the lion sighting. And we're back up and running, but poor old Rusty overheated a little bit and we're starting to, as you can imagine, all of that equipment that we sit with at the back that broadcasts the signal and a live drive to you, it started getting a bit hot and we were sitting right in the sun. So we've decided we gave Rusty a moment to cool down and now we're gonna head across to the Hain Den. But I thought I'd just stop at one of the other water options for those thirsty lionesses. But unfortunately for them, it's guarded by a group of dugger boys just like Rest the, just like the Vuyatela Dam. And just a quick look at the clouds and the beautiful sky. They've been rolling in all afternoon, bringing false promises of rain once again. And every now and again, I think I hear the faint rumble of approaching thunder. And there's our Dugger Boy group. Not going to spend too much time here. Just wanted to show you that there is another liquid option for the thirsty animals of Juma. Unfortunately, at this time of year, almost all of them come with an accompaniment of taciturn and irascible buffalo bulls. when we were with those lions, we saw some unexpected, at least from my point, unexpected aggression. And Rita, who is a South African watching locally in Johannesburg, you were wondering whether or not maybe one of the females might be pregnant. And if that could account for the aggression that we saw. Possibly, maybe, could be. As I said, it's, we're right at that cusp now. So when a pride takeover happens, and new males come in, the lioness is going to a false estrus for the first few months, partly to calm the males down, 
and give them a mating opportunity, but also to make sure that they don't invest in producing a new set of cubs only to find that the takeover males are not up for the job and are then booted out by another set of males that will then kill their cubs once again. So we're right at the cusp of the time period in which they might be pregnant. They might be coming into genuine estresses now. Happens at around three to six months into a takeover. But then again, of course, that's the general rule. And as you know, we don't have rules out here. The animals don't read the books. They don't read the research articles written about them. And thus, it is possible that they are pregnant now no reason why it couldn't be. If it is the reason for the aggression, I wouldn't have thought so. And the reason I say that is I think that the only time you're going to see, start to see a pregnancy like that really impacting on pride dynamics is at the later stages of pregnancy. And that I can tell you definitely is not the case because the later stages of pregnancy in lionesses, you can actually see their nipples start to enlarge. They start to take on quite a dark color and occasionally an almost waxy film over the top of them in the days and weeks preceding the birth. I'm not sure what the reason behind that bad temper was. I'm not saying that your theory is wrong at all. I just, I'm not entirely sure what it was all about. Maybe just grumpiness over the size of the kill and the fact that they didn't actually have that much access to meat. They look nice and fat, but for a lioness, this is not going to be enough to sustain them for more than 12 hours before they're on the move again. And it may be a day or two before they have to start thinking about hunting. And just to give you a rough perspective, those three lionesses finished off the rest of that buffalo kill and moved on within a, the space of about seven hours, or no, let's say about 12 hours, that they moved on at Buffalo's Hook Dam a couple of days ago. And that was just three of them in a male. There's now five lionesses who all had to share a portion of a buffalo roughly the same size. And Wayne, I wanted to, and Wayne and all the other viewers, we've chatted a lot about the possibility of hyena coming through. And Wayne, I don't think they're aware of the kill just yet. That's one possibility as to why they haven't made their way there yet. Might also be that there's only one, or if they are aware, it might only be one or two of them who have no desire to challenge the lionesses on a hot afternoon like this. They'd rather give them time to gorge themselves and get nice and fat and lazy before moving off towards them. That being said, I'm on my way now towards the hyena den. I stopped by the Galago waterhole just to check what was happening there and look for any signs of the hyenas because they use that path regularly from the den site towards quarantine. We are approaching the den now. Let's go and investigate and see if they show any signs. I, I don't think so. I'm also starting to think it's probably more likely that they're going to go wandering around as it gets a little bit later and a bit cooler. But they will discover it. I can almost guarantee that by tomorrow, whether or not the lionesses are, have, were there at the time or whether they would have moved off, I can guarantee that kill will be gone. You will probably only find one or two pieces of bone left. Ooh. Perhaps I should remember to shut my door so that I don't go tumbling out onto the roadside, as entertaining as it would be. Now, it's a difficult point because those females are sitting without males. males male lions, of course, are a pride's first defense against attack by hyenas or not necessarily attack, but attempting to drive them off a kill. But Shrub, you were wondering how many lions it, or hyenas it would take to drive the lions off a kill. If it's a lone lioness on her, by herself, even a combination of two hyena behaving particularly aggressively towards her could well send her packing. With a group of five like that, you're probably looking, let's say we, we really, really the dynamic should be about two to one. 
So you'd look, be looking at a group of 10 hyena that could really properly challenge that group of lionesses. But again, that's a general rule, and that's in a case maybe where the lions are really inclined to protect their kill and risk being injured. Both animals, hyenas and lions, want to avoid conflict and injury at all costs, and that applies across the board for all animals. They don't want some kind of a debilitating injury that both of them would be more than capable of inflicting that might actually impact on their ability to hunt in the future. So it depends. If those lionesses are feeling full, they feel like they've made the most out of the kill, they've eaten the best parts, there's a chance that even a couple of hyenas could drive them away because the lionesses might decide actually it's not worthwhile, it's not worth their time to go and fight with lions. Lions are much bigger, much stronger than them, and capable, and they're faster. They are capable of much faster bursts of speed. And speaking about hyenas, we have arrived at the den site. All seems quiet. Two females, one at each entrance to the den. One there, observing our approach. Probably pretty. Hard to tell. Hello, girl. Back to sleep. And one Franklin picking up all of the scraps and bits. Let's see what happens here. Is she even going to look up? Nope. They're so used to Franklin's wandering past the den site. There's the other female with one cub. I can't tell who it is. A little ear twitch. But since our view is a bit restricted and they seem to be quite settled, let's pop back over to Scott because his lines have got up. So the lioness closest to us was actually stalking the one that was lying down. And we wanted to just get you across here in case we saw a playful run and pounce. But that's quite the opposite of what we were hoping for. And back to Sleepy Lions. We will be sure to keep you updated if there are any more signs of movements. But for now, it looks like all is at peace again. And we're going to send you back to the hyena den. And from this perspective, I can't work out which hyena we're looking at. I'm struggling to, at any rate. I can't see her ears properly. It's difficult to tell with this view that you, she has pre presented us with. She's having a sniff of the air. The wind has changed direction. It's now blowing in the opposite direction, so it's blowing away, blowing the scent away from the hyena den. which means that they are probably completely unaware, for now, of its existence. And what will happen in this case is it probably won't be these females that lead the, or discover the kill. What may happen is one of the, either the sub-adults or the younger, lower-ranking members will be wandering around, looking and exploring, looking for an opportunity to have some food. And if they do discover the lions in the carcass, then they'll do that low whooping call that we so often hear from hyenas and that makes such an incredible impact on those listening. And for the rest of the clan members, that's a battle cry to come and join them if they found food for them to eat. And they really do, as spotted hyenas, have an incredibly wide vocal range. Anything from those whooping calls to little giggles when they get to food or when they're playing submissive. There's actually... I'm not looking too busy. Is that madam? I looked away at exactly the wrong time as she sat up properly. I think it might be the mother of the newest set of cubs. Oh no. Having a quick scratch. 
Randy, I just wanted to pop in to investigate what was happening at the den site. I don't necessarily think I'm going to stay for too long. I just wanted to explore and see if there's any sign of activity from these hyenas. And since they're resting and Scott's lions are up and looking as though they might want to go and have another drink, let's head over to his side. So we've just got into position and here come the lioness. And it's the three that didn't get to drink earlier, so a perfect tag team. The two that have quenched their thirst are making sure nobody comes and tampers with their hard-won meal. And these now go to quench their thirst, and it's going to be an absolutely wonderful way to finish off the safari. Oh, that was a Franklin that you heard screaming for its life there as it saw the lion and it's flown up into the marula tree there. Great work on the camera, Andrew. So that's what that racket was all about. Nice and dwarf, long so alarm calling. Andrew to the right of the one on the right. Boom, just there. There it is. So the dwarf mongoose are also alarming at the lion. Look at that, the smallest carnivore in Africa with the largest. Awesome. Natalie and Finney in Ohio, and you'd like to know why we're not doing the fireside chat tonight, or if we are doing the fireside chat tonight, we are not. And the decision was made not to because the lions were on the property, and obviously we would rather be watching lions than sitting around a campfire talking, especially after not seeing lions for so long. And that was one big reason. Another big reason is that we knew that these lions would be walking straight past the fireside chat area in order to quench their thirst. And I'm going to stop here to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now, this is going to be awesome. Straight ahead of us, you can see A, an impala, looking very intently at the lion, and B, the log where we sit for our fireside chat. And now Andrew can pan across to the lion, which are making their way straight towards that position. So that is why we decided against having the fireside chats. And what we will do is as soon as the lions are not here to entertain us, we will do the fireside chats sometime this week, who knows, maybe even tomorrow. But we are not going to forego viewing wildlife to chat at those campfire chats. So I'm sure you're all in agreement with that decision that we made. Listen to the impala alarm calling. Nasal snort, that's what you can hear. Come on, one more. There we go. And you may be wondering, why is this impala not running away from the lion? Well, they are now. Um, and they're coming straight past us over there and the reason why that they oh look at this one um well done andrew and the reason why uh, awesome there's some elephants up ahead i don't know what i was talking about but obviously not hugely important and let's try to get into this part where we can the lion and the elephant in the same frame. Which I think is going to be somewhere here. The elephants are just moving beyond the fireside chat spot, Andrew. The lion sadly won't be in the same frame though. There you go, the Ellie's. And look, the one in front's racing towards the marula tree where it knows it's going to get some fruits, as are the rest of them. And look at how awesome this is. And who would have thought you would have seen the elephants running to their meal? So the lioness in front was that one. There's another two further behind. 
and it looks like they are literally going to go straight past or through the area where we have our fireside chat. Beautiful, beautiful views here. And for those of you who don't know this pride very well, there's three older lioness and two slightly younger ones. And Sabrina would like to know if the two slightly younger ones will be hunting with the pride yet. And yes, they certainly will be. All of the lioness within this pride will be contributing towards hunting. I'm surprised these lioness are taking an interesting route to get to the water hole. The others went through to our right over there. These two are taking, well, these three rather, are taking a slightly different route, possibly straight past the final control room where Nikki and Kirsty are sitting. So we might have to get them to rush out so that they can see them. And I think this is going to be the spot where we get some wonderful two shots of the lion and the elephants. The elephants are busy snacking. They've arrived at the marula tree that they were hoping to. And now you can see they've calmed down and are snacking away. And here's the line on the left of your screen. Absolutely awesome. So today we've had lion and buffalo in the same frame and shortly, well right now, lion and elephants. What an incredible afternoon. We're being absolutely spoiled rotten. Look at this awesome stuff. And Safari, you would like to know what time does the sun set? And in this part of South Africa, it sets at the moment at about quarter to seven or 20 to seven, so about five or 10 minutes ago it would have set. And here's some more Impala have detected the lion. And we'll expect to see a lot more alarm calls from them. But it depends on where you are in South Africa. If you're in the Cape Safari, the sun sets much later, probably at around 8 p.m. And we've got wonderful long days down there in the summer months. And obviously in winter, the sun will be rising much later and setting much earlier. So our days are much shorter in our winter than our summer, as is with everywhere. There are the Ellie's snacking on the marulas nonchalantly as a lion walks through the frame. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Let's see what happens here because the impala are all running around wildly and there's quite a few young impala. So who knows what may happen. I just want to get you into a slightly better area to understand the chaos that's unfolding here. There we go, this is going to be great. And one last thing that Safari would like to know is how to go about watching a fireside chat. Well, Safari, we usually do them for the last half an hour of a broadcast on a Sunday. So all you have to do is sit tight and everything will happen for you. But it's something, like I said, that we usually do on Sundays. Obviously, we've been very busy over the last few weeks and months, either with Nat Geo broadcasts or with skeleton crews working day in and day out to get these live safaris to you so we have forgone the fireside chats which do create extra work for us and we do intend on getting them back up and running and we're going to do one tonight until the lions went and ruined it for everyone so it's their fault these are the suspects causing the lack of fireside chat tonight not us I think Nikki and Kirsten need to get ready to get off their seats in the final control room and jump out and go and stand at the gates. That will keep them safe from these lions as they pass, and that way you'll get to see them as well. Another glimpse of the girls in the final control room. I know you got to see them on that clip we played earlier on. Oh, 
don't know. This is bizarre. It looks like these lions are trying to go and drink elsewhere and are not going straight down here as I expected them to. And who knows where they are going to drink? It appears like it must be the Gallagher waterhole that they're going to go and drink at. So sorry, Nikki and Kirsty, I'm not going to get a glimpse of them. There are the signboards for Gallagher and Voyatella that you got a glimpse of. The two camps here at Juma. And the little path that this lioness is about to cross over is the path that the directors walk along from left to right and then down to the final control room which is just down there in those bushes. Michael Moss who's done some research on the mountain lions of America and you say they range from between 40 kilograms and 80 kilograms. So in and around that rough figure that I thought would be the case and thank you for that. That is for male mountain lions and the females will be naturally a little bit lighter than that. But the lions are moving through this bush alongside us and this is the entrance to the camps Vuyatella and Gallagher and what I'm guessing these lionesses are going to do is they're going to follow this fence straight past the back of the DRC which is where some of our crew or the majority of our crew sleep at night and then through a little gap to the Gallagher waterhole. And it's impossible to follow them through this very thick bush here. So what we'll probably do is try and loop around to the waterhole. I'm guessing though that it's probably going to take them a bit long to get there. So that may not work out, but we can try and do that. I don't think we're going to get any more view, decent views from here. <coughs> so I think we can just say goodbye to them now because this will be the last views of this evening but we will be hot on their trail first thing in the morning there's no doubt about that oh, well what a day it's been and a huge thanks to everyone involved. The morning was also spectacular, so it wasn't just the sunset safari that was highly enjoyable. Thank you to all of you involved. Well then to Nikki and Kirsty and Jamie for getting that great footage of those lioness hunting between the safaris, that at least you got to see a little bit of what went down. And well done again to Jamie who got those lines first thing this morning because without that then we would have been nowhere to start with. So thank you and thanks Andrew on camera, you did a great job as well as to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control room. We're going to send you over to Jamie for the end of the safari. gentlemen it has been another one of those wondrous kind of afternoons the kind so amazing that you can barely believe that it's real and I'm going to do a very quick thank you to you all as well as a big thank you to Tebs and the lovely ladies in FC as well as for Eugene for dealing with Rusty's overheating problem now I'm just going to say a short goodbye and then we're actually going to play that clip of what we witnessed this morning one more time for those lucky few who are watching the end of this sunset safari. So enjoy it for now and we will catch you for the sunrise safari tomorrow. Cheers guys. Um, Jamie Scott's running around quarantine. Is <laughs> that going to be an issue? No, how oh, cool is that? That's so, so cool. cool.
Oh, oh shit, it's still alive. It's still alive. Yeah. So guys, Easy. how are you feeling? Yes. How cool is that? Sorry, it's, sorry, this isn't live, guys. <laughs> We're sorry, it isn't live, everyone. But they've just taken down this buffalo. Here's the buffalo at the back coming through. Big cow. Wow, okay, so we're back at DRC. We had to leave the sighting because there were other vehicles wanting to come in to see. We were just going to pop down for five minutes to show the ladies, the lovely ladies from FC. Say hello to Kirsty and Nikki. Hello. Hello, everybody. And we ended up with one of the most intense sightings I've ever seen the female coming back to try and rescue her calf. And the calf was shame. The calf was alive yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Crazy. Very difficult to witness, but at least the Nkumas are not going to go hungry today. Jeepers. Wow.